Nature-based solution is one of these new fluffy and vague terms that have emerged over the past few years, together with uh, natural climate solutions or ecosystem-based approaches that are aimed at addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. Now, what are these nature-based solutions? Well, according to the European Commission, nature-based solutions are solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, which are cost-effective, simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits, and help build resilience. Now, if that is clear to you, you are obviously smarter than me. In practice, uh, we see that these nature-based solutions encompass a broad range of good activities, from agroforestry to restoring forests and mangroves. But the problem <clears throat> is that they also promote an alleged monetary valuation of nature, as well as carbon and biodiversity offsetting, as Michel said earlier, according to the uh, 2020 IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solution. So there is no if or but, there is no uncertainty about that. Offsetting is part of the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions, and it is also part of the European Commission uh, definition, as per a written answer to a question raised by uh, Michel Rivasi earlier. Now, what is this uh, biodiversity of setting and why is it problematic? Mm. Well, first of all, this, this involves a monetary evaluation of nature, right? So nature is being reconceptualized as a series of so-called ecosystem services that benefits humans and all the rest, all that does not benefit humans directly is being considered useless and not worth preserving. And then services are then valued in monetary terms. Now, it is interesting because in reality, it has been shown that what is being measured is not nature, but only a few selected services, while the rest is willfully ignored for simplicity's sake. For example, under this approach, a river would be considered a recreational, um, recreational fishing services, and that's obviously a very uh, narrow-minded approach of it. And the pollution of the river could be evaluated only in terms of lost fishing days, whereas the impact on the local flora and fauna might be ignored. Um, and it has also been shown that the monetary valuation methodologies that are being used to, to put the, the values on nature are incredibly simplistic and biased, relying in most cases on surveys where you would be asked, for example, how much you are willing to pay for the Parc du Cinquantenaire to still exist next year. Now, as a result, the values being produced do not represent nature and not even a proxy. And so for all the talk about putting a price on nature, this is not what is actually being done, simply because it cannot be done. So now let me ask you a question. The European Commission has published a figure earlier this year evaluating the value of nature in the EU at 234 billion euros. Now, what does this figure mean since we cannot live without nature? And also in order to, to put it into context, this figure represents roughly one month of revenues for the oil and gas sector. Now, does such a figure, will such a figure help protect biodiversity or on the contrary, facilitate its destruction because that would be so cheap? And it is important here to, to make a, a clear <laughs> distinction and clarification. I mean, it's measuring and accounting uh, the state of our ecosystems in physical terms is a good thing. What is problematic is that the, the attempt at accounting in monetary terms, which is neither feasible nor necessary to protect nature. Now, the second issue with uh, nature-based solutions uh, that I mentioned earlier is offsetting. That is, instead of reducing our emissions or our destruction, we would plant a few trees or restore a few habitats, most often in low-income countries where land is cheap and claiming correctly that it compensates for our climate inaction and destruction. For example, imagine a real estate promoter wanting to build an airport in the south of Spain over a flamingo habitat. Well, he could fund the project to restore habitats for bats in Greece and claim that he has offset his destruction. But of course, we all know that more bats 
do not equal less flamingos. And while this example is an extreme form of, of setting, this is the one that was promoted at the 2016 IUCN Congress and the one that the European Commission has been promoting for more than a decade now. And here again, the distinction is essential and I want to be clear. Restoration is a good thing, as are some of the other activities uh, in nature-based solutions such as agroforestry. But restoration is different from offsetting. Uh, by definition, offsetting is about enabling future destruction in exchange for restoration or other actions. And so financing restoration activities through offset schemes, that is through the granting of permits to destroy more doesn't make sense. And it makes even less sense when it is allowed to compensate the destruction of an ecosystem by the restoration of another one in another place. And in fact, this lack of environmental integrity is reflected in the appalling track record of carbon and biodiversity offset projects. I mean, there's been plenty of data on that, but just to quote a few studies, uh, there was a 2017 study published by the European Commission that found that 85% of the offset projects used by the EU under the UN Clean Development Mechanism failed to reduce emissions. And likewise, uh, many studies have found when it comes to biodiversity offsetting that between two thirds and three quarters of biodiversity restoration projects fail. Now, beyond the environmental failure, many of said projects have also been found, as Michel said, to be associated with human rights abuse from murder to rape to torture and to land grabbing, especially in low-income countries. Another crucial issue is the fact that these offset projects do not come in addition to curbing destruction, but in most cases instead of, as be, and that's because both are being put on an equal footing within net gain biodiversity strategies or net zero emission targets. And of course, when restor um, restoration and curbing destruction are put on an equal footing, uh, restoration and offsetting are chosen because they're so much cheaper. And all of this is not really surprising because as we understand it, the goal here politically is to address climate change and biodiversity loss only to the extent that it does not challenge economic growth and vested interest. Now there's one last thing that I would like you to consider. And this is the enormous financial interest at stake in instrumentalizing nature-based solutions for offsetting. Nature is starting to be considered as a new asset class by the financial sector. And according to a recent report from the World Economic Forum, climate and biodiversity finance could unlock an estimated $10 trillion of business opportunities. Now, of course, this is framed as an alleged need to involve the private sector to finance conservation and therefore a need to make conservation profitable in order to attract them. And yet, we all know that legislation mandating a reduction in biodiversity destruction does not require fiscal space at all, nor private finance. And so biodiversity offsetting and nature-based solutions are also starting to be considered part of sustainable finance and they could therefore be a significant part of the 25 trillion euros of assets under management in Europe. And let that figure sink in. Imagine for a second what that would mean in terms of exponential growth of asset projects and the human and geopolitical implications of such a growth. And I want you to consider also the fact that this private finance does not come for free and brings with it the extremely high financial returns requirements, which means an ever increasing and completely misguided pressure to make conservation profitable, whether or not it trumps environmental integrity. And so for all the reasons mentioned above, offsetting is part of the problem and not the solution. And therefore agroforestry, habitat restoration and other positive activities should never be considered as or financed by offsetting, because doing so makes it worse than nothing. And yet, because offsetting is so much ingrained, embedded into uh, nature-based solutions, uh, whether in the IUCN global standard or the European Commission definition, we fear that the, the term cannot be salvaged. And for that reason, instead of using this 
tainted umbrella term, we now prefer to refer more directly and specifically to the good activities within NBS, such as agroforestry, for example. And one last word about the real solution. Well, the solution is for us to really refocus and prioritize on curbing destruction. And that would require at the bare minimum, separate accounting for destruction and restoration instead of having net gain targets. Because when curbing destruction and restoration are mixed together, as is the case with offsetting or within net zero or net gain targets, well, first of all, it gives the misleading impression that they are comparable it removes accountability and it creates an ir irresistible temptation to destroy and restore instead of curbing destruction because the former is so much cheaper. Thank you very much.